Hi, welcome to the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. My name is Rebecca Morris, and I am a professor of painting in the Department of Art at UCLA. And it is my great pleasure to be here tonight. The Department of Art at UCLA acknowledges our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gavrilino Tongva peoples. Tonight's presentation is part of a series of artist talks presented by the UCLA Department of Art, and I am immensely honored to introduce the Spring Art Council Chair, Chitra Ganesh. Chitra Ganesh's drawing-based practice brings to light narrative representations of femininity, sexuality, and power typically absent from the canons of literature and art. Her wall installations, comics, charcoal drawings, mixed media works on paper often take historical and mythic texts as inspiration and points of departure to complicate received ideas of iconic female forms. Ganesh's studies in literature, semiotics, and social theory have been critical to a steady engagement with narrative and deconstruction that animates her work. Her vocabulary draws from surrealism, expressionism, Hindu and Buddhist iconography, and South Asian pictorial forms such as Calcot and Madhubani painting, connecting these with contemporary mass-mediated visual languages of comics, science fiction, news photography, and illustration. On a personal note, I would like to add that her deep investigation of and with materials and quite often vernacular materials such as brown paper, wrapping paper, hair extensions, bicycle reflectors and shower curtains is incredibly rich, striking and satisfying. Chitra Ganesh is a maker using her hands. These touches and material choices are paramount to her work and how it becomes readily available to the viewer, drawing them in, creating an urgency and a power of experience. Chitra Ganesh lives and works in Brooklyn and graduated magna cum laude from Brown University with a BA in comparative literature and art semiotics and received her MFA from Columbia University. Her work has been widely exhibited both locally and internationally, including at the Queens Museum, Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, Berkeley Art Museum, Bronx Museum, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and Baltimore Museum. With solo presentations at PS1 MoMA, the Andy Warhol Museum, and the Brooklyn Museum. International venues include the Foundation Sandretto in Turin, the Saatchi Museum in London, MoCA Shanghai, Kunsthalle Exnergrasse in Vienna, the Kunstverein Göttingen in Germany, and the Gothenburg Kunsthalle in Sweden. Ganesh's work is also widely recognized in South Asia and has been shown at the Indira Gandhi National Center for Arts in New Delhi, the Princes of Wales Museum in Mumbai, the Devi Art Foundation in New Delhi, the Trenvakor Palace in New Delhi, and the Dhaka Art Summit in Bangladesh. She has been named a Rabina Foundation Fellow for Arts and Human Rights at Yale University Law School and U.S. Art in Embassies Program Resident at Neurox, South Africa, an Estelle Leibowitz Endowed Visiting Artist, Kiro Laskar Visiting Scholar at RISD, and an Artist in Residence at New York University's Asian Pacific American Studies Program, and a Hoder Fellowship at Princeton University's Lewis Center for the Arts. She has held residencies at the Lower Manhattan Cultural Center, excuse me, Council, Headland Center for the Arts, Smack Mellon Studios, and the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Ganesh has received numerous grants, including a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship and awards from Art Matters Foundation, Joan Mitchell Foundation, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and New York Community Trust, and most recently, the Anonymous Was a Woman Award. Her works are held in prominent public collections, such as the Philadelphia Museum of Art, San Jose Museum of Art, Baltimore Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Her most recent activities include public projects for pandemic viewing in 2020 via the Public Art Fund and Creative Time, 
inclusion in the Bronx Museum's Born into Flames Feminist Futures, which is up now, and her installation, A City Will Share Her Secrets If You Know How to Ask, at the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art in New York, which is also currently on view. Upcoming in the fall of 2021 will be an exhibition at Hales Gallery in New York, and she will be participating in the Honolulu Triennial next spring. So just a few quick notes for the audience. Uh, please note that this program is being recorded and will be available later on the Hammer website. This program is conducted via Zoom webinar, so you can see your names and anything you type in the chat or the Q&A boxes. We'd love for you to include your, an introduction to yourselves in the chat box and feel free to talk with each other there and to use the Q&A box to type in questions you have for the artist. So please do stay after the talk for the Q&A. And now, without further delay, please join me in welcoming Chitra Ganesh. Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you to the Hammer Museum, the UCLA Department of Art, and uh, to my friend and colleague, Candace Lynn, for this invitation. Um, I'm so delighted to share my work with you this evening. Um, we, I'll be going through uh, some, a trajectory of the development of my work and uh, I'll conclude with some current projects, including some of those that uh, Rebecca Morris just mentioned in her introduction. Um, okay, so let me get started here, share my screen. Okay, great. Um, so I, um, I wanted to start with a little bit of context for my own development and um, <clears throat> for my work, for my practice, uh, which is anchored in drawing, but extends across, uh, across media. And um, I was born and raised in uh, New York City. And so these experiences of being in New York um, and also some of the experiences I had traveling in India, uh, some of the earliest visual experiences I had are the ones that I feel uh, have been most formative to a lot of the directions that my work even is currently taking. Um, so images such as this, so, being part of a family and community where there were not a lot of artists and where going to museums wasn't part of our, um, our standard leisure activities, a lot of the artworks and artistic interventions that I first witnessed, my core visual experiences were such as these outside of the museum. Um, and this is, these were in the subways, um, which I started riding when I was uh, nine years old um, for school. So um, I wanted to, um, sorry, one second some trouble with my camera. Okay, there. Um, so this is an image of a subway car that was painted in the uh, late 70s, images of Keith Haring drawing. Um, so from, from my initial encounter with art, there was an emphasis on um, site, on place, on uh, vernacular visual language, on public space, um, both in New York and also um, some of the images that I remember to be most striking um, in my early childhood travels in India as well, which continued uh, every year. So those, such, uh, those images included like this uh, movie posters, painted movie posters. They were also um, public interventions that were very much integrated into the site. Um, there was a lot of graphic sensibility that caught my attention, um, deployment of different kinds of graphic languages. Um, and 
alongside those were other kinds of uh, public site specific installations and practices like these uh, line drawings, ephemeral line drawings known as columns, which are done on the street uh, with rice flour. And, um, and you can see here that there is such an integration between the maker, the site, um, the dialogue, the use of public space, who the audience is, all of these things um, really were important to me and kind of marked uh, an integrated and complex viewing experience. So alongside images like these, I also grew up with a set of, of visual uh, images and also a, a set of absences uh, that I'll talk about, which also uh, inform my work. So the image that you see uh, here, this is a home altar actually. So something like this is quite ubiquitous amongst certain communities, uh, certain Indian communities. And this, um, this mixture of iconography of everyday objects, um, of myth, of daily material, vernacular materials, matches, flowers, um, artificial flowers, all of this, um, this kind of the, the mix of the transcendental and the quotidian that were part of these kinds of experiences were also something that informs my work. Alongside that, um, the, the importance of the icon or of iconic feminine imagery is also something that is rooted in these kinds of representations that I grew up with. And to see how the icon transcends different kinds of um, media and form. So on the left, you see an original artwork that is actually, I think, uh, in the collection of the Orange County Art Museum. Um, in And this is a Caligart painting, which uh, is done with gouache and on tea stained paper. And then on the right, you have um, a card for a party invitation for a community social gathering that my parents went to. So this way in which the iconic image could um, could shape shift and move through time to, in, to inhabit very contemporary references as well as very ancient ones was really interesting to me. So it, it I think it's the beginning of the, the kind of seeds of trying to link the mythic and the speculative in my work. So alongside all of this really rich, um, moving, fantastic, um, kind of stimulating imagery, I think I also encountered um, as being someone of Asian and South Asian origin, the child of immigrants in the United States in the in the 80s, a lot of um, a lot of erasure and absence, which was also interesting um, for me because it highlighted a certain disjuncture between the um, between the kind of heterotopic set of images and this wild, excessive, fantastic way in which multiple visual languages would collide in um, in works like this or in something like this. And then um, thinking about the way in which there was a marked absence of South Asian representation in mainstream American culture uh, or media. So this, this image, uh, I'm stopping on this image because I feel uh, it, in a way it embodies a lot of the the kind of polarity of representation that I encountered. So in my own world, South Asian culture was very much alive and contemporary. And in the museological world or the world of the art institution, the culture was often relegated to objects that were seen more as or, or equally as artifacts um, and not necessarily part of a living dynamic uh, process of cultural production. So in relation to that, um, there were also images like this and this 
which furthered that sense of dissonance and erasure. Um, so images like these are, were the only mainstream uh, images of, of South Asian representation that I remember growing up with in 1985. This uh, Afghan girl, uh, which was shot by Steve McCurry, uh, which is a National Geographic uh, image, and the, there's a there's a story about this image that, if we have time, I would love to share in the Q and A. But you can see um, here there's two uh, mainstream media news magazine covers across 25 years and this persistent kind of representation of the female subjectivity from South Asia of this part of the world is one that um, in these images kind of invites to be rescued or seems to be portrayed in a way uh, that is not as embodied of the subjectivity as these images could be. So something like that was very much in contrast with this, with this kind of um, exuberant sexuality and femininity that you would see in contemporary Bollywood. And so many of my own first works, uh, this is part of a series of paintings, were interested in exploring this uh, disjuncture between the um, between this collision of, of visual languages, uh, the anthropological, the news outlet, the photography, the Bollywood painted cinema poster, the melodrama, um, as well as the kinds of images that were assembled of South Asia as part of a colonial, um, these are from children's textbooks, as well as art historical paintings and um, street photography. So um, these, were, these were some of the initial uh, works that I made. I made them in my house. I painted them on bed sheets and um, I was interested in seeing how painting um, and the, the field of the painting could somehow reveal this, um, these rich temporal layers in art history and also in the representation of a, of a certain kind of feminine subjectivity. Um, so from this, uh, from this point of painting, I would say that um, like for many people, um, painting is, um, I guess it was my my introduction to visual art and also my gateway drug, but there were many ways in which I felt that the um, baggage of painting was something that I wanted to um, move, step aside from. And that and um, thinking about moving into developing my own iconography, I began to work. My work continued to, um, continued to center painting and drawing, but it moved off of the canvas um, and in, into multiple trajectories. So the first one is it moved onto the wall. So as you can see here, um, there, there's a lot of content um, in these wall works that is resonant with the painting, these, um, this kind of fractured and multiple subjectivity, uh, this body that's extending its limits. And in, these, in the drawing language that I began to develop, uh, sculptural elements and three-dimensional materials and protrusions from the surface began to be an important part of that. Um, these are, as Rebecca mentioned, they're many of them are very much everyday materials from um, the kinds of rug runners that one would have in one's home and many um, of the immigrant homes were in which the sofas were entirely covered in plastic that I grew up in. So these are the kinds of materials that I was um, interested in sort of um, 
resituating or thinking about differently um, and also using them as a point of entry uh, into the work so that there was something familiar and unfamiliar about these about pipe the way that in which you would encounter the hair the pipe cleaners um, and thinking very much about this uh, the anthropological concept of of matter out of place and thinking about how for example uh, certain certain materials have vastly different significances, signifiers, depending on their placement or their um, context. So hair is one of those. Hair on, a long hair on a woman's head is a signifier of beauty and uh, of, um, you know, gender normativity. Long hair on the wall or on the floor would have a different resonance. So, um, I continued to work in this site-specific way, and the, the works are also very much interested in scale and thinking about the relationship between the human body of the viewer, our body, and um, these much more monumental or fractured bodies that are in process, in process of transformation, um, changing, and uh, transgressing their own boundaries as well. So this is an installation that was done for the Asia Society. Um, this one was in uh, New Delhi at Gallery Espace. Um, and so the this and these these works and working in this way um, on the wall gave me a lot of freedom. I felt differently about the marks that I put down because many of the works, the majority of the works are ephemeral. So after the work is done, um, I, it's the documentation is the trace of the work as well as the lived experience with the work. But um, so the, the, I was interested also in the way in which working on the wall and working on such a large uninterrupted surface was able to afford a further exploration or investigation of scale. Um, something which I think think a lot about the, the kind of energy or quality that happens when the viewer is overwhelmed by the monumentality of the figure and that too of figures that are often marginal. So um, this, this is uh, what the scale experience would be like um, within the work. And a lot of these images, this wall work is also um, informed by my own relationship with statuary uh, in my time that I spent in um, in India. So these these kinds of relationships that really compel one to contemplate one's place in the universe and also think about the scale of humanity differently were very, are very important to uh, anchors to the way in which I work with scale. Um, this, I'll just go through a couple of more, um, a couple of other installations that are, are multi-part here. This is a work, this is, Eyes of Time, which was a piece that I um, presented at the, oh, so sorry, Wait, what's going on here? I'm sorry about that. Okay, uh, this is, this is a installation that was commissioned for the Sackler Center uh, for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. And the interesting thing about that space is that uh, in its iteration that I was participating in, every work that was in the space had to be related to the Judy Chicago piece, um, the dinner party that was on the other side of the gallery. So one of the um, one of the figures in the dinner party is um, is Kali. And so that's how this particular installation came together. It was my first time working with an actual 
iconic imagery rather than using that form to create my own figures and characters. Um, and the, the work is called Eyes of Time. Um, one of the things that Kali as a deity embodies is, um, is change and time and transformation. And so um, I created these uh, particular representations um, or riffs on thinking about this icon of time, change, creation, and destruction. Um, oops, sorry, there we go. Using many of the materials that um, you had seen already, as well as um, fabricating sculptural works for, um, for this piece. So uh, my installation, through the different kinds of opportunities and projects that I put together, the installation um, began to grow in regard to how the sculptural elements uh, worked and brought, brought, additional, brought additional meaning to the work. Um, these are some more images. So as I mentioned before, I, I'm really interested in how icons are time traveling and shape shifting and how one can tell a visual history through icons of femininity and power um, as a counterpoint to the ways in which art historical narratives have been thus far um, constructed. So thinking about the ways in which the image of Kali traveled um, and also thinking about, um, this is from the 1890s, an oleograph. Um, this is also, this is an example of kind of contemporary, the way in which these iconic performances come into contemporary cosplay. And alongside this work, I also um, curated an exhibition with the museum's collection, looking at ideas of iconicity, multiplicity and power um, and female subjectivity. So uh, this, this part of my work is also something that is central to my practice is thinking about ways in which the exhibition and the exhibition form can expand um, and offer new ways of understanding the art historical trajectories that we can access in order to um, experience the work or to create our own work. So that idea Something like that is very much inspired by how much we learn are learning now about the deep past and about art from the deep past. So this this is from the Cave of Hands in Spain, and it was through a lot of kind of scientific imaging and material um, analysis that they realized that many of the earliest cave artists were women, actually. And so that that was really interesting to me because there was a whole larger narrative spun out about um, the women being at home, the men hunting and gathering, the men having more access to public space and therefore having more possibility for representing it. So thinking about things like that and thinking about how our own making looking and um, context can interrupt some of those patterns of making meaning. Um, this is a work at the Hayward Galleries in London that was part of a larger um, installation that spanned several walls and was part of a show called Kiss My Genders, which was looking at queer sensibilities in um, in material and performance, photography and representation. So um, here's another image of sort of the sense of, of scale that you see in the work. Um, all right, I'm gonna get over here. So a lot of this idea of, of exploring scale and exploring the visual language um, is something that I have, 
I've developed by working across media. That's it's a really important part of my practice to think about different ways to investigate um, similar ideas, similar impulses, similar forms. Um, so working in photography and creating installation and sculpture that is also within um, real time and space and not the symbolic space of the painting or the drawing has, has been really important to my work. So in that, this is a work that is actually um, thinking about the, a figure that is both monumental and marginalized. It's based on a, um, it's based on a Hindu, a part of the Ramayana where there's a, a goddess who tries to um, seduce the hero and is mutilated uh, as a result. So, and this was kind of thinking about um, her underwear, so. Um, here's some more of the imagery uh, that you can see. And I'm very interested in the ways in which um, specific media access um, sort of viewing and um, semiotic histories for lack of a better way to put it. So thinking about the ways in which photography like this um, is based in, you know, is thinking about dominant ideas of ethnography and fashion in photography, and also seeing some of the relationships between the images constructed in the photographs and the way in which that informs my drawing practice as well. Um, I'll just go through a few a few of the works on paper. So these are all these are all about 40 by 60 or 50 uh, 50 by 70. And I've become, uh, in, in the process of working on the wall, I've brought some of that material sensibility back to paper and the canvas. And I've also become interested in working um, with certain textiles and the histories and the connotations and the resonances of those, of those textiles, um, including, as you see here, fish nets and um, laundry rope, um, rose petals, and uh, many, many others. So. This, um, this is called After the Storm. It's uh, just to give you a sense of scale, it's probably like 85 by 120 inches. And so part of what I was also interested in with this work and in some of my use of textiles is certain kinds of uh, repurposed both clothing and also um, like this is upholstery and um, kind of everyday kitchen supplies and thinking about the histories that are uh, reside within these works, um, these existing pieces of textile. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my, um, I'm gonna talk about my comic work now and thinking about this as a second trajectory that my work took as it kind of slid off of the canvas and onto the wall and then also onto the printed page. And um, from here after this, I'll, I'll be concluding with some of my more current projects. So yeah. Um, so alongside, um, alongside developing my own visual vocabulary and iconography, while creating wall drawings um, and working, working in on a much smaller scale to bring it to a larger scale, I was also beginning to create comics and thinking about how to integrate image and text. Writing has always been a big part of my work. And so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. So interesting to actually to this pandemic year and my, the, the development of my work was that 
many of the seeds of these ideas developed um, in the year of September 11th when I was not able to access my studio. So I was at home making small drawings and napkins, looking, um, looking at old comic books uh, that I had grown up with and rereading them. And then um, thinking about these to start to create my own um, my own sort of interpretation and my own narrative of using some of these comics and these stories that I had grown up with um, and also integrating them with my visual vocabulary. So um, I'll come back to, so these are some of the first images that I made. Um, in this vein, I made a comic book that was a 24 page comic book called Tales of Amnesia. It was integrating um, several of the, the stories that I remembered most and that stayed with me. And um, it was kind of like taking them apart at the seams and stitching them back together in a new form, in a form that in which the narrative itself was more experimental. It seems to start as a comic and then it kind of, it kind of unravels and um, the relationship between image and text becomes a lot more, um, becomes a lot more surreal or associative so that in in a way the the way that the text functions like here when everyone has gone down the hill i wonder if you were wandering in your neck of the woods shirtless searching for a cat that disappeared years ago having failed to eat its own tail so the the text itself is almost creating a third or an additional narrative space for the viewer to occupy. It's not, it doesn't have an exact correlation with, um, with the image, but it's, it's, it's creating these multiple narrative layers that I, I wanted to access because I wanted to uh, convey, transmit something of a dreamlike quality where things appear in fragments that are very, um, compact and need some time to be unraveled. Um, another part of this, another part of this uh, project that was really interesting to me um, was the way in which, oh, I'm sorry, somehow my, my video stopped, excuse me. Um, working with comics made, made me reflect on and also was inspired by reflecting on the way in which certain kinds of um, visual and narrative materials, namely materials of childhood, form a really potent repository of imagery that we continue to, to hold space for and that we continue to access. Um, and these, these are among some of those that I grew up with. Um, these are stories, choose your own adventure stories. They end in multiple ways, depending on where, where you begin with them. Um, and these, the images which I showed earlier um, that my work takes inspiration from, these are a series of comic books called Amar Chitra Gata comic books. Um, and they are a series of originally over 500 um, and then kind of condensed to 100 um, that are widely circulated uh, comics that tell, that transmit stories about history, mythology, um, religion, and uh, folk tales in South Asia, um, specifically produced in India, but including stories that um, span the subcontinent. So I was, um, so I'm really interested in, in the way in which forms like these, and you can see here in the center image, like thinking about how, um, how certain figures were portrayed, thinking about skin color, gender norms, that these kinds of earlier images um, are, are very powerful vehicles to transmit. Um, so among the other kinds of inspirations for my work include other artists books like this by Max Ernst. Um, 
my lifelong love of comics, including the Hernandez brothers, and also thinking about how um, thinking about how fairy tales and folk tales and comics, children's stories, actually um, can really be harnessed to to transmit certain kinds of co uh, social codes and norms around gender, thinking about just how Little Red Riding Hood and the story of Little Red Riding Hood is also the story of how um, a, it was a way to kind of talk about sexual violence and the threat of it and the way in which, you know, a curiosity or a certain kind of female protagonist would, um, would encounter this unless she were to regulate her behavior. Um, so I think these these are some of the these are some of the ways in which I comics are a, a very powerful form to um, to reshape some of the ways we think about these stories. So I love the form also for how um, for how capacious and elastic it is. It can work as a very large in a large billboard or tableau size format. It can also, um, I also create installations where these works are kind of ripped apart. Um, they function as billboards as well um, and the, the kind of semiotic language of comics, which I think is so interesting. For example, you can, you know what is a speech bubble, you know what signifies thought, and you know that these boxes on the top are like a third person narration. So using those different narrative strategies, um, I think is, has been, um, has been really sort of like it, stimulating and very open kind of field in which I can continue to explore. So, um, so as I continued working with comics, I began to, and and this was concurrent with my own daily engagement with science fiction and seeing the way in which speculative narrative, science fiction, all of these genres that were perhaps minor genres and literatures were becoming more and more uh, mainstreamed in our world. And thinking a lot about um, some of the ways in, with, in which myth and science fiction intersect. So thinking about how, um, how both of them ask certain kinds of ontological questions to the viewer, to the reader. Who are we? Where did we come from? Um, where are we going? Um, what, what is the role of the human? Where are we headed as a race? What is justice? And also, um, what is time? Uh, what, what does it mean to be an other or the other? Um, to think about in myth, you have characters that are godly, um, that are angels, that are in other ways um, beyond human just as you have characters that are cyborgs and um, thinking about the, the possibilities for representation in science fiction as well. So that, that was something that kind of led me to thinking about some of the ways in which science fiction allowed a, a racialized subjectivity to be there and to be embedded within the story and not necessarily exist as a sort of um, representative or ambassador of a particular kind of uh, difference. Also thinking about the way in which time, um, time and narrativity have certain parallels in myth and science fiction. So thinking about the way in which um, what Joseph Campbell, for example, calls in media race being in the middle of things um, is something that um, we see even in Star Wars. We see as much in Star Wars as we see in the Odyssey. Um, so these these kinds of questions and this research into the um, into points of connection between 
between myth and um, science fiction, between the possibility um, of where myth and speculative storytelling me um, led me to make works like these. Um, this is called Atlas. I was thinking also about the burden and the punishment of Atlas, but also thinking about the thinking about experience itself as um, as a burden, as something that one brings along. So um, I'm going to conclude uh, with a a few of my, a couple of current projects that explore the threads that I've been uh, talking about so far. So um, this one is called The Scorpion Gesture. Uh, this was a series of five animations at the Rubin Museum in New York. Uh, I was really interested in working with this museum because in relation to what I had talked about in my introduction around objects and the museological way in which culture, South Asian culture was, um, was displayed and produced. I really loved the Rubin Museum's way of thinking about these, um, these cultural forms as very alive and well in our current moment and as objects of art in and of themselves. So I created five animations based on the character of Padma Sambhava, who was known as the second Buddha. These were um, projected around the museum and they were active, they were motion activated. Um, and they, the, the, figure of Padma Sambhava was one who was meant to be invoked or to present himself on earth when we were at a moment of, um, of transition or apocalypse. So every, he, uh, his story originates in the eighth century and he's also the one who brings Buddhism to Tibet. And in his story, every 200 years, teachings are supposed to be revealed about um, the about his own role and the role of Buddhism in terms of confronting an apocalyptic time. So these are images of these works installed um, around the museum and they were in relation to uh, particular collection works. Um, and now we're gonna look at three videos. So if you could um, play the videos, please. These are about five minutes um, and we'll talk about these at the end.
Um, thanks so much for playing those. Um, so those were three of the five animations. I will be happy to speak about them uh, in the Q&A if you have any questions about that. Um, and I wanted to continue to show a couple more projects before we wrap up. So the, the Rubin Museum work uh, also included uh, drawings and works on paper. Uh, this was part of an exhibition called Face of the Future. And I, I was thinking about what the language for this, this imagery that was thinking, uh, that was a fusion of both this speculative and mythological narrative um, would, would be like in relation to the visual language of uh, contemporary science fiction and contemporary science fiction movie posters, um, specifically from outside the US. So, um, thinking about how the um, how popular visual languages like uh, science fiction, illustration, movie covers, uh, movie posters, uh, book covers, um, thinking about how these are also very much central to our own uh, visual language of the future and understanding of the future. So. I commissioned, um, I wanted to include some of these um, posters from the Global South and from outside of the US, but they were difficult to access. So I actually invited uh, seven artists to create posters uh, that were part of the exhibition that were thinking about new ways um, of understanding the science fiction poster itself as a, as a form, as a speculative form. Um, so this project was shown um, in, it, it's shown, been shown in multiple iterations. This was in Times Square um, as part of the Midnight Moment. Um, and concurrent to developing this project, I was also working on another project uh, that was a two-part project. Uh, the, the first was a suite of prints um, based on a feminist science fiction novella um, by the name of Sultana's Dream, which was published in 1905 by a Bengali writer by the name of Rokea Hussein, otherwise known as Begum Rokea. And um, that work became the center point for a larger work, uh, an installation at the kitchen in New York City. So. These are images of the installation, but I want to tell you about this story, which is quite amazing. Um, so it, Sultana's dream is, um, is a story in which the narrator, it's a journey story. So in that way, it's very mythic. The narrator, um, Sultana, has a guide that brings her through this, brings her to another place. From, um, from her bedroom. The opening sentence of the story is, um, I was lazily lounging in my bedroom one night contemplating the condition of Indian womanhood. And she gets a visitation and she finds her, she finds that she has landed in a new place. Um, and this place is called Ladyland. And it's a futuristic uh, city, a series of places inhabited entirely by women. So, um, the, there's many different parts of the story, um, but she taught that there's a lot of focus on the structure of the place rather than necessarily on the individual. So this idea of a focus on the structural or the collective and collective knowledge gathering and sharing was something that um, really struck me about the about the story. And so um, there was also talk about so many things that resonate so deeply today. It was hard to believe it was written over a hundred years ago. So um, about the relationship between physical and intellectual strength in um, relations, uh, gender relations uh, between men and women, a work-life balance, um, time to work and time to dream, importance of dreaming. Um, water storage was also a uh, part of this flying cars, um, electricity that was stored, as well as um, a land that whose borders were open to refugees. So 
all of these elements of the um, of this kind of this feminist utopia that Rokia Begum constructs felt just as necessary, if not more necessary than ever um, between 2015 and 2018 when I was working on this work. Um, also part of the installation of the kitchen you see here, I was thinking about what an archeology span for this place would be. So I created um, a couple of really large scale sculptures. Um, this is a sculpture called a manuscript, which is a, a large aluminum and silk hand onto which another series of stories and images are projected onto the work. Um, so this was also in the space and then also part of this installation was um, a, a video installation that was called How We Do. And this was me thinking about how important collective knowledge sharing was as part of this feminist utopic imaginary. And also, why isn't this working? Let me see. Sorry, this happened before. Um, so this this was a video installation. It was over here in the back. And what I what what this piece was about was about thinking about how collective knowledge sharing um, appears and the iterations of it today in our contemporary world, including ASMR videos and YouTube videos and how-to videos. So this included videos that I had sourced from um, South Asia of driving schools for women or different kinds of um, scientific innovation that women were spearheading, but it also included videos that I sourced from my friends um, where people were able to share a skill. Um, the work was also shown in South Asia, in, um, in Bangladesh, in Dhaka. So, that was important to me that it was uh, also shown there. And this is a version of the video installation of the piece there. Um, I also created a totem for this space, um, thinking about the archeology span of the space um, and thinking about the way in which multiplicity was really important for this project. So it wasn't about one or two, but about the way in which many, many um, and the collective body and the collective energy came together to, um, to enact change and innovation and also more a more just conditions for living. So, um, you know, as I mentioned before, these, this, this statuary um, is also, Oh, in a way connected to the same impulses that led me to create the works, the large scale monumental drawings on the wall, which is this relationship between um, the human body and the iconic and the iconic figure. So um, I'll just quickly end with, these are works that are currently up so that you can maybe, well, I don't know who will ever get to go anywhere, um, but, for those of you who do come this way, this is the work at the Leslie Lohman Museum that's currently up. It's an installation. It's part of what's called the Queer Power Facade Commission, where an artist is invited to um, cover the facade of the museum, which is 12 windows. Um, and so my work here uh, is called A City Will Share Her Secrets, if you know how to ask. And um, it was very much thinking about these different kinds of um, the, di the different kinds of layers uh, that actually uh, comprise New York City, the layers of queer history, the layers of black and indigenous history, um, the way in which social movements have been really important public space to the building of uh, queer community and queer life. Um, in the city. So these are some of the things that I was thinking about as I was um, making these works. And um, I'll just end with some of the, so all of my work um, is very much 
um, inspired by and guided by the process of research and looking at the the different the the different ways in which um, these histories and these spaces have already been recorded in the archive, um, some of the absences within those archives, and actually connecting some of the dots that we, um, we might not necessarily put together to um, think about a more kind of integrated understanding of what um, a queer urban history, specifically one in New York City, um, held especially in during a pandemic year where um, much of the inspiration for that piece came not only from research into older social movement moments in queer history like the first dyke march um, but also the protests and the marches of last summer so this um, this was on june 10th this was um, the Trans Remembrance Day and also um, around the George Floyd protest time in the city last summer um, and around the country and around the world. And so I was thinking a lot about the Trans March of 2020 and the very first um, Trans March of 2005 that I was part of, um, as well as my own participation in um, queer activism. This is this is a picture I found of myself in the archive from um, 1995, actually. So it was it, it was fun to do this kind of archival research. And this was one of this. So this is the last project I'll uh, I'll end here. And this is um, this is another public project that I did with the pandemic, um, and it's called Urgency, and it kind of brings all of these uh, ideas together. So I'm going to, um, I'm gonna stop here and um, we're gonna have some time now so that we can um, talk together um, until I think for another 20 minutes, yeah? Okay, great. Thanks. Um, okay, great, so I have, I have a couple of questions here. What are some things I'm watching or drawing inspiration from these days? Okay, so I am, um, I'm reading a lot of poetry um, and I'm reading a lot of poetry somewhat specifically, but I'm reading poetry in general, but I'm also reading poetry that's more specifically in relation to grief. Um, I lost my father on April 1st. Uh, he died rather suddenly and um, I was unexpected. And it was just uh, two, it was two weeks before the 23rd death anniversary of my mother. So for this moment of the pandemic and these moments of grief, I think poetry is uh, everything. So that's something. And then what, uh, what I was watching for fun this last week um, on the trashy fantasy tip was the nevers. So, oh, from castles. Hi, castles. Oh my God, I love you. So sweet. Um, how is it to work with mediation? I'm so happy that you're here. How is it to work with mediation technology and the digital? Um, I think it depends. So let me read out the question. Um, so how is it to work with mediation technology and the digital when so much emotion and expression comes from the analog hand-drawn line? Um, do I feel like technology forms a stronger formal relation with futurity than the analog process? Um, I think not necessarily a stronger relation to futurity, but I think it's, I found it working with animation to be very really challenging because um, I'm, I don't necessarily 
work with linear narrativity. So to figure out how to have a sense of narrative logic that's really strong and tight within the work, but not necessarily about a temporal progression was challenging as a maker because I wasn't necessarily going to be able to kind of storyboard or map out the piece. Um, I was interested in, uh, I was interested with those animations in, um, a sort of fleshing out um, a digital or virtual space that also could accommodate the materiality of the hand-drawn. So one of the ways in which we did that in the animations was using what is known as parallaxing so that there would be different layers of hand-drawn imagery and they would feel kind of flat like paper cutouts, but you would still get a sense of um, spatial depth and dimension um, within the work. So, um, so I think those are ways, those are ways that I really appreciated um, working with animation. And it was also working with animation, um, thinking about a certain time and time period as well. Like for some of those works, I looked a lot at um, the work of Harry Smith, um, which was like moving image work from the late 50s and early 60s as well. Um, and I think one, another way that the, the sort of bond of the technology is the, is, is that there are certain really complex viewing conditions with video that so many of us are already equipped to navigate and decipher. Um, very similar to how people um, come with an, um, a, a, quite a well-developed sensibility of how to read comics, even if they weren't formally taught that uh, format. Yes, um, so this question says, is offering context for those viewers who may be less familiar with the Mabharat comic, um, but also all those other rich and long traditions, something I consider. So yeah, I think that there, in each exhibition, there were different ways to offer context. So like, for example, in the kitchen show with uh, Sultana's dream, when you were in the space, you can't see it from the installation images, but there were um, audio cones um, of the story being read out loud by four women or four people um, aged 11 to 80. Um, there were four women, a girl and three women um, who read the story who, um, so that people could hear the story as they were looking at the images and the words would be part of the experience. Um, and with the Scorpion Jester, there was a lot of text also that came along with the piece and other videos that are developed. I think that it's also my hope that there would be, um, I guess enough, enough there of visual interest or layers that would be compelling for people to be able to glean something or take away something even if they weren't familiar with the entire range of um, of the content references. So yeah, are there more? Did I miss something else? Oh my God, there's so many I didn't see. Scroll down, I'm always really bad at that. Um, how have I responded to critique and resistance in contemporary versions of Hindu? You know, this is a such an interesting question. I haven't, um, there hasn't been, um, there hasn't yet been the kind of resistance that people might wonder if there was or might think there was, I think in part because the, the figuration itself is not typically anchored to a religious figure. It's, it's a, for example, it's like a multi-armed um, shape-shifting kind of 
interpretation of femininity, but it's not related specifically to this deity or that. So that's um, one part of it. I think the other part of it is that the, um, the context in which I started creating this work um, is so vastly different from the context now, um, both in India and in regards to um, right-wing Hindu nationalism, Islamophobia, um, a number of things that use strong arm leadership, a number of things that you actually see around the world. Um, that context was not the same in 2002. So I think, I think there are probably ways in which I was able to, to develop, expand and continue exhibiting my work um, in that way, um, because the work itself is not about a religious critique. So that's part of it. And I would welcome any other thoughts and impressions on that. Oh, hi, Alexandra. I have, yeah, I do have some photographic projects um, that I've been working on as well. Um, so yeah, there's, um, there are some that are, um, there's a bunch that actually that I made that I haven't shown yet or recently, but yeah, photography is gonna continue to be part of um, my practice. It's just something, it's a way of thinking. Um, each, each medium for me is a way of thinking. Um, and some of them I have been more drawn to like the way the way of thinking that printmaking offers is something that I've been with recently for um, for a while. But I'm sure that will come back around with photography as well. So thank you. Well, um, favorite reactions from queer and Indian communities. Um, I think, so the Leslie Lohman piece, a lot of, I mean, I didn't even get to mention this, but I'm just going to share my screen while we, while we talk, because, you know, a lot of the people, um, in these images that, uh, are here are actually my friends. And these are, these are from, um, you know, places we went and things we did. And um, so I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who are also experiencing it as a, a certain kind of documentation of um, certain histories. And so that's definitely part, um, part of my work. So it's very, it's very much part of my work and, and my life and thinking about that piece at Leslie Lohman, it was very much also um, like an opportunity to reflect on my own kind of um, the, the places and the spaces and the communities that grew me up as a young queer person in New York City and um, how much those inform um, this terrain uh, for me, like ontologically, politically and in every way, so. Um, so that seems to be the questions. Are there other questions that I missed? Um, well, thank you guys so much. Um, it's, it's been wonderful to have your attention in the 15th month of a pandemic um, in the middle of things opening up here but falling apart in South Asia and uh, I really appreciate everyone's time here. Um, wait, I just have to just do one thing. So
Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think, I think I'm just gonna hang up now. <laughs>